Hello folks! I wanted to highlight this fairly unsung area of hand-drawn animation. It's something that I struggled to find information about up until it was my job on the movie My Father's Dragon, even though I already had quite a bit of experience in TV animation. I had some misconceptions about it going in, and I was mostly guessing at how to do it in my previous work. So I wanted to make a video that would have been useful to me in the past and provide information that's otherwise hard to get. It's actually a very major part of the process that takes a lot of work and brain force. It's known for being possibly the biggest and therefore most expensive department in hand-drawn animation. It's this huge chunk of the production, but there's no books about it, there's no famous cleanup artists, and I don't think there's even a decent segment of a book about how to do it. Check this out. These are the cleanup credits from Tarzan. It's like a Marvel visual effects credits kind of situation. So, what exactly are all these people doing? In short, it's redrawing the rough animation, but more clearly defined. If the rough says, it's something kind of like this, the cleanup says, it's definitely this, which is no small task because there's no leeway for getting something wrong. So that's what these different roles were for. It's like the scene is going through a series of filters to end up in a purified form. The effort and expense is one of the reasons that some projects skip this step altogether. Or, you know, use it in a reduced capacity. I love that sort of style as well, but that's not what we're doing today. I'm going to be talking more about what's actually happening in the minds and hands of cleanup artists as they work, and less about software, shortcuts, and so on. We're basically just working with layers, brush, and timeline, but you're not too different from one software to another. I'm using Krita for this, which is free, and it's my favorite program to draw in anyway. So let's really get into the nitty gritty picky details, because in my opinion, that's where the most valuable information is with regards to this topic. The word to live by here is that we are refining. We're going to go through in different stages and we're going to fix problems as early as possible. We are removing anything ambiguous and we're working to clarify the rough. With art in general, if we want to control what we're doing, it's good to work in stages. We know which steps we're going to take before we start. And we're going to make sure each step is working well before proceeding to the next. In my older work, uh, student work, I wasted a lot of time like polishing work that was foundationally weak and find the results disappointing compared to the amount of hours that I put into it. If you put extra care into those earlier foundational stages, it actually makes the following stages become much easier and faster and you can be more confident about the choices you're making. Any times in the previous rough stages that you said whatever, it's good enough for now, we'll fix it later. Uh, this is the time to pay for those things. So that you know where we're going, let's look ahead and see what steps we'll take. We're going to fix up our rough. We're going to set up our file, analyze our reference, establish our layers, brushes, and all that. Then we'll draw our first clean key, known as the spot key, our first major tentpole. We'll work through the keys, from the most different to the most similar. From there, we'll take a pass through the scene's breakdowns, then make multiple passes going through the in-betweens until all the drawings are done. And then we'll give it one more check. Okay, our starting point here is this little fan animation that I did months ago. Let's get the rough into better shape before we put any clean lines in. This is something of an unseen part of the process that you might not be privy to unless you've done it yourself. These drawings are usually only seen by the cleanup artist himself, usually get deleted along the way or left behind in an old version of the file. As a student, I had a big misconception about cleanup after seeing the unfinished version of Beauty and the Beast. I didn't know that there was anything between something like this and something like this. I thought it was much more direct. 
No, actually. <laughs> it's often necessary to rebuild or fix the roughs, or at least parts of it. Some rough animators draw very neatly, which makes life much easier for cleanup, with little reworking required. You could skip this whole middle step for something like this, because the animator already did it. On My Father's Dragon, we didn't have separate key animators and in-betweeners. The rough animators would do most of their own in-betweens, but those of us in cleanup would have to add in-betweens, fill in from twos to ones at times, and flesh out partial drawings before the actual clean part. Another of my beginner mistakes was rushing it. On the movie, we did about 10 drawings per day, and as I understand it, other movie productions also go at around 10 to 15 drawings per day. Although measuring it that way is not completely dependable, because naturally, some drawings are harder than others. Skipping through the frames, we're focusing on different parts of the character and trying to see if any flaws jump out, looking for things to fix and improve. Over time working on the same character, you'll get better at spotting model issues. At a glance, you'll be able to spot things like arm too long, eyes too far apart, and so on. If I were working with someone else, we'd be able to cover each other's blind spots in that regard, so I'm sure that I'll notice issues in this very animation after I'm done. But constructively critiquing yourself is the important thing here. It's pointless to say things like, the eyes look weird. It has to be followed with how to fix it. Are they too big? Too small? Are they the wrong shape? Or maybe... They're actually fine, and it's a connecting part that's making it look off. We're working with structure and construction in our drawings in order to confidently plant things in the right place. Adding the in-betweens that I left out last time. I used less charts than most rough animators would, but that's just because I have what I want in mind, and it's just me who's in-betweening it. This depends on the software, but I like to mark keys and breakdowns along the timeline. Personally, I do red for keys and blue for breakdowns, while everything else is just the default color. His inner ear fluff was an area that I ended up working on quite a bit over each pass. It's too thin in this initial rough, so we're gonna go through and make it thicker. There's a little bit of forgiveness for inconsistency because it's a soft and flexible part, but Due to its color, it is an area of high contrast, so any morphing or jittering will be noticeable and distracting. I added this little bobbing movement uh, instead of a hold in the previous version, but that's not something clean up with that. Okay, now it's a step better. Before we actually make a clean drawing, let's get everything set up. There are some clean model sheets from The Lion King out there, but they're very low image quality. You can't tell the line quality and the notes are a struggle to read. But luckily for us, there is a 4K version of the movie, so we can get a really good look at it. I found one or two clean drawings from the movie too, so we can glean some things from those. The line actually does have a little texture to it, a little life, boil and variation. You can see it quite clearly in the eyes due to the colour contrast. It's not distracting because the volumes are very good. The movement is squashy and expressive, the line colour is mostly not too different from the fill colour, and of course, they're furry characters, so the texture is appropriate. I believe they would have done this with just a regular wood pencil or maybe clutch pencil, as opposed to the mechanical pencil lines that were often used elsewhere, which give a solid, an even line. So let's take screen caps from similar shots and we'll make a brush to match. I took one of the default brushes in Creta, which I also used in the rough, and just tweaked it a little bit, making the size very sensitive to pen pressure by adjusting the curve like this, which helps get the pencil kind of look, and making the brush opacity clip so that it's never below a certain percentage. This will give us a more solid line, hopefully avoiding issues with colouring later and letting thin lines show. Let's try it out. 
Looks like a good match. So we'll save that and make a note of the brush size. Brush smoothing is something that isn't actually as useful as you might expect. It definitely comes in handy for long, simple lines, but I'd say only use it selectively because if you get into any detail at all, it becomes hard to control and your drawing can become less descriptive or less defined than what's intended in the rough. And we'll set up our layers. This one's very simple, but do plan this out if you have anything that's at all complicated. One thing that's usually best to avoid is something called match laning. Say for example, you have a setup like this with the character sitting at a table. Match laning is when you use only one background layer and one character layer, and you match the line around whatever's in front of the character. It was more common back in the days of cells when it was harder to make more layers. But maintaining that edge from frame to frame is tricky. It can cause issues in compositing, and if you have a soft edge, it's impossible. So it's better to break it up into layers, and any overlapping part can be its own layer, with a color separation line closing the gap. Now, what's a color separation line, or set? It's a line that shares the same color as the fill, usually indicated in red or blue, and changed later. Now we're just making sure that we have our reference handy. Let's actually get into drawing the clean lines. This is not really a separate step if you're working alone, but on a production, this is typically one drawing per scene that's drawn by a supervisor, and it's used by the regular cleanup artists to show them what changes need to be made from the rough. It's a dependable drawing that you can compare the others to. I'm going to choose this key as the spot key because it's a fairly standard pose and expression, while the others are more unique, so changes made to this one will be more applicable to the others. Be sure to keep notes of the changes that you make at this stage. One of the major parts of cleanup is tracking the model adjustments. For example, I've made his nose wider and less tall. So from now on, each clean frame needs this adjustment, keeping the squash and stretch proportional to whatever's in the rough. Later on, it'll be important to keep comparing the rough and clean side by side to make sure that the animation isn't being lost. Cleanup is actually more about making good volumes than it is about the lines themselves. The different styles of line are kind of just the coating around the volumes. It's why you can have a style with boiling lines that doesn't look like it's drawn wrong or animated wrong. But if you have nice lines with bad volumes, it can look amateurish and overworked. The rough should get you most of the way there, but while we're doing cleanup, it's a good chance to solidify it a little more. Generally, I think that you get nicer lines when you do them quickly and confidently with a big stroke and just redo it until it's right. But that isn't a concrete rule. You'll see me not doing that in a lot of these uh, screen recordings. Once in a while though, when you nail a line first try, it makes you feel like a genius. Something I like to do that helps with long lines is to make a little mark where the lines connect and at the peaks of any curves, and then just connect those bits. I do this all the time when making changes too. I'll often keep the old line there and only erase the old line once the new one's in place. If you are zooming in and focusing in on the line itself, just make sure that you never lose track of what the actual thing you're describing is and what it's doing. When I got into adding the fluff, I found that I liked drawing an initial line along the surface as if the fluff wasn't there. Then drawing the hair, which always looked better when I drew it quickly rather than slowly. And then after that, just erasing the crossover. Okay, now that we have this drawing established, we have a clear mission for the rest of it. We'll move on to the other keys. Now I'm introducing one of the most important takeaways from this whole video. The workflow of going in multiple passes through the timeline in smaller divisions with each pass. Generally, we're going to be drawing key positions for the whole scene, 
and with each pass dividing segments of the timeline based on the spacing of the animation. Starting with the widest spacing on the first key pass and ending with the tightest in-betweens. You may have run into issues before where the drawings look good separately, but the animation is inconsistent once it's all put together. Using this process, we're able to iron that out. There is a similar common issue in which the roughness of the animation appears to hide inconsistencies, and once you have to really define it with clean lines, the issues become glaring. So to choose which keys to do first, let's go with the ones that are the most different. From there, find the next most important keys, and as you work on those, keep checking it against the spot key, remembering changes that were made in that drawing. Now, keep going through in passes until all the keys are done. Don't be afraid to adjust neighboring keys as you work on another. It may be a little tiresome to adjust keys that you'd previously considered complete, but we are saving time in the long run from having to fix it later as we in between, which would require fixing more drawings. Be sure to keep in mind the design rules for the character and the overall style. I don't have those available, I'm largely guessing at what they did, but as I went on I found that there's a lot of this shape in the design, so whenever I'm stuck I can usually make things this kind of shape and get away with it. Okay, now before we move on, let's check what we have so far. Now, I'm making a new blank layer and flipping through the keys to find things to fix. Turning off the rough layer for now, but we will bring it back as we're actually making the changes to be sure that we're not losing anything from the rough. My preferred way to do this is to flip through and note the problems first then go back through to fix them, rather than fixing issues as I spot them. It helps me to keep track of what I'm doing. On a team, you check the keys with the supervisor at this stage, and get some guidance before moving along. On this first breakdown pass, let's go through and do one drawing between each key. Breakdowns will usually be marked on the rough, and again we're choosing which drawings to clean by which ones have the widest spacing. So between these keys, this is the drawing that we'll clean on this pass. Mentally we're switching modes a little bit at this point. At the spot key and key stage, the first priority was making those individual drawings nice. Now, we're thinking a little more about movement here, watching the arcs, drag, and so on, for each part of the character. Keeping in mind where we're coming from, and where we're going. Okay, now let's go back through it again, and do the other breakdowns, dividing each segment again. It starts to look a little bit more like it's moving at this stage, so we can spot issues like snags in the movement, or bits changing size when they're not supposed to. Something that I didn't really do a lot of here, but it is a common technique, is to copy and transform parts of the cleanup for speed. It's useful in some ways, but it can also cause some issues. It can make the animation flatter and stiffer, essentially making your hand-drawn animation end up looking more like reg animation tends to. And it can also degrade the quality of the lines, sometimes beyond what a sharpen tool could solve. But it does have some uses. In the Simba clip, I use it a bit for his eye pupils uh, to help keep them steady. And you know, check it again, fix some stuff, and let's crack on to the in-betweens. By this stage, we should have a very clear idea of what we're doing. Using the onion skin becomes more appropriate as the drawings get closer together, 
but make sure to turn it off and check by flipping regularly as you go. There's an issue known as sticking that can arise just from the nature of 2D animation because although we try to think dimensionally, it is a line drawing with a fill, it's a flat shape. It's when part of the line appears to cling to where it was in previous frames. It tends to happen on close in-betweens and especially if the movement is smaller than the width of a line, it can become really tricky to work around. Onion skin is really useful for this, we just need to make sure that the lines are separated, at least a little bit. Some in-betweens, such as this one, are so close together that it really is just like putting a line between the other two lines. If the spacing is super narrow, sometimes it is appropriate to do that. Anything more spaced out than this though, I would have roughed out earlier, in order to avoid losing the solidity of the character. When it comes down to those in-betweens where you're really just putting a line between two others, this is how I like to figure out where I'll place it. If you just turn on the onion skin and do it, there's all kinds of possibilities within this gap, right? So I'll focus on the ends of the line and the peaks of the curves, and flipping between them, trying to picture the arc that those points will follow. I'll place a little segment of the line in place with regards to the ease in or out, and then just connect the bits. Well, here we are folks. The drawings are all filled in, the timeline is full, we're finally at the end of our cleanup journey, ready to move it along to colouring. Wait! Sorry, actually we're, go we're gonna have to go through it again. One more time, from the top everybody. Let's completely turn off the rough layer for this one. We're flipping through the frames, looking for errors mostly at this point looking for any little gaps in the lines that would cause issues with colouring, looking for anything I might have missed while in betweening. Are the seps all there? Are the whiskers there? Did I remember the little lines inside the ear on each frame? Alrighty, now here we are in cleanup form. And here we are with colour and everything. You know, not a perfect Disney impression, but it's better than last time, which is what we want to see. Let's recap the major takeaways from this video to really hammer it in. If you're taking notes, these are the big things to write down. 1. Solve problems as early as possible to minimise the workload of fixing them putting more thought into the earlier stages in order to make it progressively easier as you work through to the in-betweens. 2. Work in stages, cleaning the drawings in order of most different to most similar. And 3. Prioritize the volumes over the individual lines and flip the drawings with onion skin off in order to check for inconsistencies. If you want to practice cleanup for yourself, I think it's a good idea to pick out some rough animation from Living Lines library or something like that and try cleaning it up because you'll have a style to aim for and model sheets and so on. But I would keep it short and just try to really nail one or two seconds rather than a long scene because I think you'll learn more that way. The downside to doing that would be that if you use it in a reel it might be unclear what you're saying that you did. So, you know, that would be an argument for cleaning up something that you animated by yourself. Either way, you will improve just from giving it a genuine try. Hopefully you found this useful. The next one is just going to be a quicker one about doing the shadows with Tomb Boom Deformer shapes. Um, see you later, and remember, no, no rules, just tools. Just tools. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye.